What's going on, guys? Thank you for joining us today in the podcastosphere. Is that what they call it? Podcastosphere? Um, yeah, we'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Today we have Dr. Sarah Vanier. And Dr. Sarah is a postdoctoral fellow working at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. That sounds cold. Burr. I didn't know she was up yeah. there in Nova Scotia. <laughs> And her research tends to focus on the ways that we think about our sexual and romantic relationships. And today we talk a little bit about her research in expectations and how expectations going into a relationship can affect the relationship in good and bad ways. And I tend to think of expectations as a bad thing if they're too high, because a lot of times my expectations are too high and then things don't turn out exactly how I expected, and I'm disappointed. But I think that's more of a control issue <laughs> that I have, <laughs> that I'm not controlling it. But it, it's a really important part of uh, current relationships, or if you're single, looking for one. And we talk a little bit about growth versus destiny mindset. Well, I found it super fascinating because, you know, Sarah was going over the two different growth and destiny mindset. So growth being that you will fall more in love with each other as you as you grow, as you're in the relationship. And destiny is more you feel that it needs to be love at first sight and passion and sparks immediately. And, and, and you want to keep that throughout the whole relationship. And we know sometimes that that doesn't happen. So we, I think, went into our relationship a little bit different. You coming in as more of a destiny and me as more of a growth and comes to find out, which I found this super interesting, is that um, Sarah said in her research, the stereotype is actually a lot of men have the destiny mindset, uh, which is interesting because you would think that women would, women would be more of the love at first sight, sweep me. I want a man to sweep me off my feet. And it comes out that it's not really... That's more men are like that. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. And it's important, really, it, it doesn't matter which mindset you are so much as that you recognize it and understand. It seems like the destiny can have a little bit more issues if you're super picky because, oh, it's not mm -hmm. love at first sight, things like that, that that are just never working out because your expectations are pretty unrealistic. And a lot of that has to do with our culture and what we see on TV and in the movies and online uh, is that everything's perfect and they they fell in love immediately and, and it's never like this long drawn out romance. Right. I mean, sometimes, and those are usually the better. Be like a five hour better, movie. <laughs> well, they're the blood, better plots really because right. it's like they fell in love and then he went to war and they didn't see each other and they met someone else. And then years later he comes back and uh, the passion is still together. there. See yeah. that? I'm yeah. being romantic. <laughs> like that's that guy. Well, yeah. I mean, what what she was saying is that although growth mindsets, they tend to be happier in the long run, it doesn't mean that you can't be happy if you are a destiny mindset. But she did say that it's important to really think about and make a list of what is important to you, your values, uh, your family values, and that you have similar likes and expectations. And, and that's what can make your relationship successful, even if you do have a destiny mindset. Yeah. Yeah. So lots of good stuff in today's show. We won't give you all of the stuff in the picture. <laughs> we'll let the doctor <laughs> explain yeah. that. We just get off on uh, tangents because it's exciting and interesting when we can apply that to our relationship for sure. So as always, we really appreciate you guys listening. Uh, we continue to get such great feedback, emails. We got the Love Tribe Facebook group. Yeah, with Love Tribe Facebook group. You guys are uh, joining that and it's awesome. We love to see you guys involved and we love sharing our videos and posts with you and growing with you and, and learning about you guys as well. 
and in yeah, our and journey. Sarah's been putting together some really cool downloads. If you go onto the website, not every episode, but a lot of the most recent ones, but she'll do like a, a nice one sheet where you can go on there on the episode. Obviously, you can always get our show notes, download the links, any websites, book recommendations uh, from our Lasting Love Round. But Sarah's been putting together these PDFs, so really great stuff. You can do your homework. Sarah's done it for you. It's all written there. Download it and check it out. Uh, really good stuff. Yeah, we appreciate you guys so much for, for listening. And we hope you enjoy today's episode. See ya. Today's show is sponsored by Talkspace, the online therapy company that lets you choose from over 1,500 licensed therapists. Get matched with your perfect therapist today by visiting Talkspace.com forward slash I do. That's Talkspace.com forward slash I do. Today's show is also sponsored by findyourtrainer.com, America's largest personal trainer network that matches you with your perfect personal trainer. Train anywhere, anytime. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for joining us on the show today. Hi, it's my pleasure. So we've given our listeners a little bit of your background, some of the research that you're doing. Why don't you tell our listeners why you enjoy helping people improve their relationships? Uh, right. Well, because it's such a big, important part of our lives. Uh, I sort of got into this field of research originally um, by taking a human sexuality course. And if you're studying sexuality, you end up studying relationships. They're really closely linked. Uh, and I just started getting really interested in how we think about our relationships uh, and how the way we think about our relationships uh, affects us. And like I said, such a big part of our day to day, our relationships are really important to us. So it's just really motivating to me to um, do research in that area and try and find ways that we can help people out. Awesome. Well, I think we are going to help our listeners out. I'm sure Sarah and I are going to learn some things today. And we want to talk about your research on how romantic expectations can help predict the satisfaction and commitment in young adult relationships. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that research? Uh, sure. So that was uh, research that I was doing while I was a graduate student at the University of New Brunswick. And uh, I sort of got into it again, following this idea that I'm interested in how people think about romantic relationships. Uh, and I was thinking about these really traditional uh, fairy tale types of romantic beliefs. So the idea of like, uh, you should fall in love at first sight and lo love can overcome any obstacles and you should, you know, meet your soulmate and know it right away. And when I started thinking about this, it, it seemed to me that maybe these weren't the most helpful ways to think about love and relationships. Um, so maybe having these ideas about love uh, that maybe we picked up from, you know, Disney movies and the media and from music in different places. Uh, but having these ideas maybe uh, wasn't helping us out. It might be giving us these really high false expectations. Um, and then when we're actually meeting people in the real world and having real relationships with all of the ups and downs that come um, in our day-to-day -day lives, that maybe we're going to be a little bit disappointed. So the study uh, that I, I did to sort of look at this uh, was with a group of young adults, people that were in dating relationships. And I was really interested in uh, looking at people in dating relationships because there is a lot more uh, opportunity for starting and ending those relationships and maybe deciding something doesn't work for you and going on to another partner. And we asked people a few different questions. We asked them uh, from, uh, first, how much do you believe in these ideas about love? So do you believe in love at first sight? Do you think love can overcome any obstacle? And then we also ask them about what does your ideal relationship look like? So in a perfect world, what does your partner in a relationship look like? And then we ask them, what does your actual partner and relationship look like? So we were trying to measure whether or not people thought their partner and their relationship matched their expectations. And originally when I started doing this research, I was expecting to find that people who had these really high romantic beliefs, uh, these fairy tale ideas about loves were going to be less satisfied and less committed in their relationships. But that's actually not what we find. What we actually find is people who have these strong romantic beliefs tend to be happier and more satisfied. 
But when these people are in relationships that don't live up to those expectations, they tend to be less satisfied and less committed. Um, So it's not necessarily having these beliefs that's the problem. But if you do have these beliefs and you don't think your relationship is matching that, then maybe you're going to be in a little bit of trouble. So it was was a really interesting project um, that sort of had some surprising results. That's fascinating. And it is so true. In all aspects of life, I know personally, I experience it and something I try to work on is that when our expectations don't meet the reality of the situation, that's when we're most disappointed. But it's a, I feel like a fine balance because you don't want to go in to something with just super low expectations and kind of negatively thinking about it. At least that's what the way I feel, but it's hard to keep my positive high expectations in check. So how would someone uh, maybe work on that balance? Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, you have to find that line and some of it depends on what your expectations are. So um, in our project that we looked at uh, different types of expectations. So some of the things that I've mentioned, love at first sight, soulmates, feelings of passion in your relationship. And we found that, you know, if you're expecting to have fallen in love at first sight, but you didn't, that's not that big a deal. It's People tend to be fine with that. But if you think you're going to feel this like strong, passionate connection with your partner and you don't feel that, that tends to be a bit more of a problem. Um, So one of the things that I would suggest is uh, looking at your expectations and then trying to figure out which ones are maybe really important to you uh, and also figuring out which ones are more realistic. And it's it's hard for us to to answer that about our ourselves. So um, friends and family members and all of that can be really good people for bouncing your ideas off of and getting an idea of, you know, is this something reasonable to want in a relationship or am I maybe expecting a little bit too much? I can totally relate to this because when Sarah and I first met, geez, what, nine years ago, almost, um, I was sort of battling with internally with this feeling of, I really like Sarah, uh, but I wasn't like the cliche falling in love and just head over heels and, and all these things that I had these preconceived ideas and expectations. And a lot of that, like you mentioned earlier, can be given to us through society, culture, movies, film. I don't, I can't pinpoint exactly where, but my expectation was that the woman I'm going to marry, and I didn't know I was going to marry. And that was another thing is like, I I felt like, well, if it's someone, this was later on, but that if it was someone I'm going to marry, like I would have known early on or something like that. But the, the point is, is I definitely struggled in, I looked to my mom and talked talk to her and it helps that we have a great relationship and she happens to be a, a certified therapist and she had me look at the other things and, and say, that's okay that it wasn't love at first sight. What do you like about Sarah? And then I'm like, there's all these great things. And, and uh, so, yeah, it, it can be so valuable to really just understand uh, that, your expectations might be too high or that it's unrealistic because not everything's like the movies. So I can definitely personally relate to this. Yeah. And there's some uh, other work. It's not mine, but they've sort of looked at um, people who take two broad approaches to love. Um, So what you think, you know, love and relationship should look like. And these two approaches are called growth beliefs versus destiny beliefs. And destiny beliefs are really this idea that when you meet the right person, you're going to know instantly it's just going to be meant to be. Uh, Of course, that's going to be the person you marry and you're going to be together forever, where growth beliefs are more this idea that, you know, relationships are something that we can build and we work on and they grow over time as we have all these shared experiences together. And there's pros and cons to both. People who have these destiny beliefs tend to be a little bit pickier at the the beginning of a relationship, but they tend to be a little bit more committed in the long run. Um, But people who have uh, growth beliefs, and it sounds like what your mom was talking about was this idea of, you know, there's all these growth reasons for staying in this relationship. Um, They tend to be a little bit more satisfied in the long run. So if somebody is is hearing this and, and relating more to a destiny belief, what could you tell them to to maybe change their thinking if they want to have more of growth belief, if they're with somebody, but it's not love at first sight, but they feel this connection that they think they can grow on it. Are there any tips they can use to implement it into their relationship? 
I mean, it's, it's tricky because our ideas about relationships are so, um, they're really ingrained in us, right? Like we develop these, I think, pretty young and then it's hard to change them. I mean, one thing would just sort of be aware of them, be aware of the fact that maybe you're dismissing a partner that you've, you know, gone out with once and you didn't feel that instant connection with. Maybe force yourself to give it, you know, two or three dates and see how you feel. You don't want to, you know, totally swing to the other side and say you should be trying to like force it and grow with someone that doesn't feel right. You need to find that balance. Um, but if you, you know, lean really strongly towards that, that I should know right away and have that gut reaction, then maybe it's worth sort of pushing yourself out of that comfort zone a little bit and giving people a chance to to grow on you a little bit. And is there any research on what is more successful in an individual growth versus destiny uh, beliefs and how they are in their relationships? Yeah, I mean, growth, uh, people with growth beliefs tend to be a little bit happier in the long run. They are uh, a little bit more likely to uh, handle conflict well, so conflict isn't so threatening. Like if you have this idea that the person that you're with is supposed to be perfect in every way. If you come across these conflicts and these challenges, it can be a little harder to work through them. So having that growth mindset does seem to be uh, a little bit more helpful as you're sort of dealing with the ups and downs that you know are going to come with any long-term relationship. Yeah, it's definitely one thing that I didn't go in. I think I was maybe a mix between destiny and growth going into our relationship. I didn't, but just the, I guess, society pressure or the cultural story that I feel like is, is given to us is that love at first sight and all these things. It's so strong that I was questioning, well, should I marry Sarah or should we move in together? Because I don't have those other feelings. Not so much that I went into it with that destiny, you know, seeking a partner, love at first sight, but just that uh, those ideas are just pressing pressing on me. And I imagine that happens to a lot of people. Yeah. And something actually really interesting there. I mean, I don't know if Sarah had a different experience when your relationship started, but we do tend to, f- tend to find that men are more likely to endorse these romantic beliefs and they tend to play a bit more of a role in the way they think about relationships, that men maybe have a little bit more of an ex- expectation for that idea that, you know, once you find that perfect person, you'll just know and everything will work out. So that that's something sort of interesting there and a little bit opposite of what we'd expect from stereotypes. But the research does tend to show us over and over that men, if we had to pick one uh, gender that was more romantic, it would be men. Hmm. It, it, that's interesting because I I feel that I went into the relationship from a completely different perspective. I had just got out of a long relationship and I think maybe that's what plays into the fact that I wasn't seeking somebody to marry at the moment. So yeah, I think you were definitely more of the the destiny and I was looking at it more as something that we can grow on and and we did. Our our love grew and obviously we got married and here we are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I imagine it's like Sarah mentioned, she was coming from a a much different emotional standpoint too having just got out of a long relationship. Probably I don't want to speak for her, but it we've talked about it a little bit, but not looking to jump right in necessarily but it did really grow pretty slowly but all in a good way like we were we were living together pretty fast just because it made sense uh logistically we were, and, well we traveled we took a long trip to we did peru we backpacked yeah. for almost two months like four months into our relationship so that really allowed us to connect really fast too yeah yeah and then but even after that it was uh maybe not entirely by Sarah's choice, but it was six years of us living together before we got engaged. So uh, it wasn't, we definitely didn't jump right in and, and everything was just, it grew and, and it does kind of make sense that that kind of uh, growth relationship tends to be more stable. And I don't want to say the other way can't be that way as well, but it just seems to have worked really well for us. Yeah, definitely. So you've done a little bit of research also on new parents and the expectations that they're bringing into parenthood and how this is affecting their relationships and uh, both the well-being and the sexual side. And Sarah and I are parents to a two-year-old, so we definitely are interested in hearing a little bit more about this. 
Yeah, this is really exciting uh, research that we've just started. And we we know in a, in a whole bunch of areas of romantic relationships, your expectations are important. Um, and having a baby for the first time, it sort of throws everything out of whack for a little bit, right? Like you're taking on all these new responsibilities. You're taking on these new roles. You know, all of a sudden you're mom and dad. You're not just partners. And you're stepping into a situation that you've never been in before. So um, it's really, really common for people to have expectations about what that's going to look like, but maybe they don't match what the situation is or they don't match what their partner is expecting. Um, so there's actually a whole pile of research looking uh, mostly around expectations for division of childcare and housework. So what you think is going to happen after the baby arrives and how you think, you know, you're going to divide the responsibility of, of taking care of the baby and cleaning the house and doing the cooking and getting the groceries and maybe working outside the home. And when, uh, people end up in a situation that falls below their expectations. So maybe they thought that their partner was going to be more involved in certain aspects of taking care of the child, or they thought they were going to maybe have more support from family. Uh, and that's not what it looks like. They tend to be a little less satisfied, both with their romantic relationship, um, but also with their parenting relationship and how satisfied they feel uh, with taking care of their kid. So we know we see this pattern in sort of general areas of the relationship. But what I'm really interested in is looking at sexual expectations. Um, so we know that after a baby arrives, there's, you know, really this dip in the quality of your sexual and relationship well-being. In that first year postpartum, uh, parents are having sex less often. Um, it's really common to be experiencing problems with uh, sexual functioning. So even just how you, uh, the mother's body responds um, to sexual stimulation. Um, and a, a lot of new parents report just different sexual concerns. They're worried they're not doing it often enough. They're worried that their partner wants to do it more or less than them. Uh, a lot of women report concerns about how their body looks now that they've had a baby. So we know all this stuff happens, but we don't really know if parents are expecting that to happen. So do you think this is what your life's going to look like after your baby arrives? And if it's an unexpected situation, if you have these violated expectations, are you going to be less happy with your sexual and romantic relationship? Uh, and this is really something that we don't know yet. Um, so we're trying to answer this question in a study where we're following uh, a few hundred first time parent couples from the middle of pregnancy around 20 weeks up to one year after their baby arrives. And we're really going to be able to look at this pattern of change and see if people's expectations predicts how they're doing after the baby arrives. It's so interesting because, you know, as a first time mom and a fairly new of, of a two year old, my expectations, I didn't really, I mean, I knew things were not going to be the same down there, but I didn't really know what to expect. And I think that kind of led me to not be so upset when things weren't, you know, we didn't have a amazing sexual chemistry, you know, directly or soon after Stella was born. So do you find that when people have well, I guess we know when people have lower expectations, they're less disappointed. But have you found how their expectations are meeting their reality, I guess, in this situation from other moms? Yeah, so not yet, because we're, we're still collecting all of this. We're sort of in the middle of things. But this is one of my questions also is really, is it better for people to be sort of optimistic or maybe even a little bit naive? So to not expect things to be so bad. Because if you're optimistic, you kind of have this self-fulfilling prophecy. If you're thinking, oh, I don't think it'll be, you know, yeah, there'll be stuff, but it won't be that bad. Well, maybe then after you're there with, you know, a baby, you're going to be more likely to um, initiate sexual activity with your partner or try things because you're thinking, oh, it, it's not that bad. I, you know, it, this is what it's supposed to be like. On the other hand, being optimistic or maybe a little less informed might set you up for these unexpected problems. Um, so we don't actually know which one is better, like having this sort of optimism or um, being prepared for the worst. It might depend on the person. It makes me think of um, like going into exams and like you're, you're waiting to get your grade back and you convince yourself you're going to fail. So you won't be disappointed no matter what happens. But again, maybe, maybe having that slightly going into a blind is helpful. We will know in about a year and a half, once we're able to to really look at all of our data, but it's it's something that we just don't have the answer to right now. That's pretty cool. I'm looking forward to seeing those results. Me too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll have to do a follow up, and not to mention we talk about the changes in the woman's body, but just 
the time <laughs> when you're new parents. It's like, where does the time go? If you're trying to even just be intimate sexually or just have a conversation with your partner, it everything becomes more difficult and it's something that can put a real stress on a relationship. So are there any tips outside of the, the bedroom stuff that, that new parents can watch out for? I mean, it, keeping that intimate connection, even if uh, sexuality is a little bit off the table or put on the back, burn for, back burner for a while is, of course, important. And I mean, it's hard because you really are switching your roles, right? Like you are switching from being just partners and being able to be focused on each other to, you know, focus on caring for someone else. And that's where all your time and energy is going. So I would say when you can, even though it's very hard, especially at first, to uh, manage to carve out a little bit of time just for the two of you to sort of uh, reconnect in little ways you can, uh, that you can, even if it's like small little moments throughout the day, and to sort of what I mentioned before, be open to the idea that even if parts of, you know, your sex life and what it looked like before you had the baby are off the table, find other ways to be um physically affectionate and intimate and fit that into your schedule if you can. Awesome. Well, we will do that follow up in a year and a half. We'll get you back on and <laughs> Sounds find great. out. Well, before we go to the lasting love round, I wanted to just follow up with the growth versus destiny mindset. And to mm -hmm. me, it, it's very clear that people will be following into one or the other of these, or maybe a little bit halfway in between a combination. Are there any things that someone in the destiny mindset can can work on? Uh, we talked a, a little bit about what they can do, uh, but to, to make sure that they're not always getting crushed or always dumping the person because they're like, oh, we didn't lock eyes from across the room sort of thing. To me, I feel like this could be a problem with a lot of single people trying to find uh, a partner. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that you can do is uh, think about and make a list of the things that are important to you in terms of being compatible with someone in the long term. Um, at the end of the day, we know that some of the things that help a relationship last are not these initial, you know, I had butterflies and, and all of that. They're things like, do we share similar values? Do we have a similar idea of what family means? Do we like to spend our, you know, leisure time in similar ways? Um, and, and I keep saying similar over and over and over because we like to think of this idea that opposites attract, but actually being similar in a lot of these important basic ways is one of the things that determines, you know, long-term compatibility to ask yourself, what are the qualities that I want in a long-term partner? And if you find someone that has those qualities to maybe hang around a little bit to see if um, you're going to grow together instead of just writing them off, if you don't uh, experience that sort of instant immediate attraction. That's great advice. And that's one thing that pops up a lot as a theme when trying to determine if someone is right for you, if you're with someone or if you're single trying to find someone is making sure that your values match up. You don't have to have the same hobbies. You don't have to have all the same likes and dislikes. In fact, I think that can be quite boring and it's like dating yourself. But if you have the same value system, that's going to be the core thing that's going to keep your relationship together and make you happy. Absolutely. Awesome, Sarah. Well, this is all great information. We will plan that follow-up interview in a year and a half. And now we got to move forward to the lasting love round. But first, we want to tell you a little bit about Talkspace. I do podcast listeners know that pretty much all of our expert guests recommend therapy as a way to have a happy and healthy relationship. So now there is really no excuse not to get hooked up with a professional therapist from the comfort of your living room couch or wherever you're at through Talkspace. Talkspace makes it super easy and you can send your therapist text messages, video messages, audio, or even live chat. All of the therapists are have been vetted and have gone through thousands of hours of professional training. So if you want to get matched with your perfect therapist, head on over to Talkspace.com forward slash I do to sign up today. And you can get $30 off your first month by using our promo code I do. 
So that's Talkspace.com forward slash I do. Talkspace, therapy for how we live today. Whether you're dating or you're single, you want to look and feel good. So findyourtrainer.com allows you to do just that. Maybe you need a little motivation or you just don't know where to start. Findyourtrainer.com allows you to connect with your perfect personal trainer. They'll meet you at your house. They'll meet you in the park or even at the gym. I met with the lovely Kenya last week while we were in San Francisco and had an amazing workout. And that's just another bonus of findyourtrainer.com is that if you're traveling, you can put in your zip code and look up the trainers that are right in your local area. So if you want to get started today, visit findyourtrainer.com forward slash I do and enter in the promo code I do to get $50 off for sessions. That's findyourtrainer.com forward slash I do. What is one tool or practice our listeners can use on a daily basis to help improve their relationship? So I would say, I mean, same thing for new parents, same thing for any couple, it would be be affectionate. So touch, kiss, cuddle your partner. Even if you're busy, take a minute out of your day and make sure, you know, give your partner a neck rub. Um, There's a ton of research showing how important that daily connection is. Oh, I could go for a neck rub right now. (laughs) (laughs) Is there a book or resource you can recommend for listeners who want to improve their relationship? Uh, Yes. So I love the website scienceofrelationships.com. Uh, So this is a blog that's actually run by the International Association of Relationships Research, er, uh, research. Uh, and they basically have a whole group of uh, relationships researchers. They're academics, um, but they're really, really great at summarizing all of this recent research in really accessible and fun ways. And it's a great way to stay on top of the latest relationship science. It's just a really fun read. I love uh, looking at it. It keeps me up to date. Awesome. Well, we'll be sure to add that to your show notes page at idpodcast.com. We've been married for almost three years now. Is there any advice you'd give newlyweds? Yeah, I keep doing new things together. That's one of the things that helps us keep that spark that we experienced at the beginning of a relationship, that sort of excitement, um, keep it alive. So doing new things like traveling uh, or simple as, you know, trying a new restaurant with a new food together, uh, taking up a new shared activity, anything new and different outside of the ordinary routine um, can really help keep that newlywed feeling going. What advice would you give our single listeners looking for a happy relationship? I mean, based on my own work, I'd say if you're hoping to find that compatible long-term person to think about your expectations. So there's nothing wrong with having high expectations. There's nothing even really wrong about having these romantic fairy tale expectations to some degree, but you really want to find that balance with being realistic. Uh, that said, You don't want to settle for something that falls below your expectations because then you're not going to be so happy. So it seems like it's it's quite the challenge. You really have to sit down and examine that, figure out where you uh, are lying on on your expectations, not settling, but then also not being super picky and never finding the person. Yes, definitely. It's It's a tricky balance for sure. Awesome, Sarah. Well, we have really enjoyed all this great information. My expectations are super high for our follow-up interview. (laughs) (laughs) Well, hopefully I deliver. You're not disappointed. (laughs) No pressure. So, uh, yeah, why don't we finish up by having you tell our listeners where they can find you, and then we'll say goodbye. Uh, Yeah, I'm on um, Twitter at Sarah Vanier um, is probably the the best spot to stay in touch. Uh, And if any of your listeners are interested in uh, participating in our research, if they are expecting their first child and they're between 12 and 20 weeks pregnant, um, they can reach us at our Gmail. It's newparentstudy at gmail.com. And we'd love to have them involved and hopefully get our answers about expectations sooner. And it was new parents with an S at the end? Yes new parent study at gmail.com. Excellent. Great. Well, thank you so much again for joining us and for taking the time to come on the show. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. We hope you guys enjoyed today's interview with Dr. Sarah Vanier. As always, all of the links and recommendations that we talked about in the interview will be on her show notes page at idopodcast.com forward slash 115. That is today's episode 115. 
And if you have not joined our Facebook group, The Love Tribe, head on over to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash love tribe fam, like family, F-A-M. We would love to have you guys join and be a part of this continued conversation about our interviews and about relationship advice and topics and yeah, just to build a community. And if you haven't checked out our website lately, I do podcast.com. We've been working on some cool new resources for you guys. Uh, We've been putting together some uh, cheat sheets and step-by-step guides to help implement some of the advice that we're given in these interviews. So for example, episode 111 uh, with Dr. Bernard Golden, we talked about managing conflict in the relationship and he talks about the seven steps to manage conflict. And so we've put that together for you guys in a I like to say pretty little document for you. And uh, yeah, it makes it a lot easier to reference back to when you're in that specific conflict or you need advice and you want a quick go-to on on how to handle it. It's super valuable. Chase and I have already used it a couple of times. We've referenced it. And we also have our 14-day happy couple challenge on our website. You can find that at uh, idopodcast.com forward slash 14. You can sign up and we send you a daily email for 14 days. And they are challenges to try each day to help strengthen and improve your relationship. So we hope you guys are finding all these resources valuable. We appreciate you guys so much for listening and we'll see you next week. 